Welcome to the Linda Mood Bell Radio Podcast, where we explore topics in literacy and learning. I'm Dave Hungerford for Linda Mood Bell, and today I'm talking with the Honorable Robert Pasternak. Dr. Pasternak is the former Assistant Secretary for the Office of Special Ed and Rehabilitative Services at the U.S. Department of Education. Welcome to the Linda Mood Bell Radio Podcast. Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here. Your career has had an incredible arc from being a classroom teacher, a counselor, superintendent, being in the Department of Ed, on commissions for special education, mental health, helping children with disabilities, the private sector, the list goes on and on. And it was really in a time of great change in the field of education in the States. Maybe you can recount one of the highlights in this era, something that really changed for the better that you were involved in. Well, that's a great question. Uh, I think um, uh, looking back, uh, I think we fixed the access issue uh, in that uh, in, in the uh, before 1975, before public law 94142, as you know, uh, students with disabilities were denied an opportunity to have the free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment that they're now entitled to receive uh, under uh, IDEA. Um, I think that in response to your question, I think uh, No Child Left Behind, uh, although it was criticized by a lot of folks, uh, one of the the great contributions uh, that it made uh, and that I hope uh, President Bush will be remembered for is the disaggregation of data by subgroup. And I think before No Child Left Behind, we really never uh, were able to shine a light on how kids with with disabilities were doing as a subgroup. Um, and with the disaggregation of data, we were really able to uh, uh, dig in uh, much better, much further uh, to the outcomes and results. And, and that has led me to the sad conclusion that special ed is not so special for the vast majority of students who are receiving special education because we're really able to take a look um, at the data and, and see uh, how uh, they're doing uh, uh, in terms of academic achievement and metrics uh, 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 in terms of the NAEP and other norm reference, uh, reference the measures of assessment. So I think that that is probably one uh, of the best things that I've been involved in and probably the most important things. And, and, and I would say that that preceded the uh, creation uh, of the President's Commission on Excellence in Special Education, which was the first time in the history of the United States that there was a presidential commission to study uh, special ed. And unlike a lot of other uh, uh, reports uh, that are written for uh, Congress, 100% of the recommendations that we made uh, in the Presidential Commission on, uh, President's Commission on Excellence in Special Education actually found their way into the IDEA 2004. And yeah, it's been uh, 14 years at, uh, as we uh, talk today uh, uh, since the 2004 reauthorization. And some folks uh, think that uh, it, it should be reauthorized. There really is no effort to reauthorize IDEA. And, and some folks actually suspect that the IDEA may never again be reauthorized because uh, unlike NCLB, where there were some uh, serious concerns expressed by folks across the country that, that things needed to uh, be fixed in NCLB, uh, which led to the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, the ESSA, which is the current uh, version of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. Um, unlike that, uh, there really is no uh, effort or no pressure on Congress, and there's nobody in Congress right now talking about the reauthorization of, or the potential reauthorization of IDEA. And what does that lack of reauthorization, what does that mean to a, a school district, not having that federal reauthorization? What would that mean? It, it means that the statute uh, and, and the regulations that were released, uh, uh, which took a long time to actually be released subsequent to the passage of the bill and the signing of the bill by President Bush, and I had the privilege of attending that ceremony at the White House where he signed the IDEA. It really means that just the, the in, in terms of the uh, statutory and regulatory language that school districts are familiar with, they will continue uh, to uh, work hard to implement uh, that law. And, and I think that uh, something recent uh, that has happened uh, that, that I know you're aware of is the Supreme Court uh, this term unanimously ruled on a case from Colorado, uh, the Andrew case. And, and in Andrew, uh, they, the court uh, found that students with disabilities were not getting the kind of uh, educational benefit from special education that they should be 
entitled to receive. And in fact, that uh, it raised the bar quite a bit, didn't it? Exactly, and, and it's. Uh, um, I think that's the, uh, your question in terms of you know how things are going to be different for school districts. I think the biggest difference is that they're going to have to work harder. Uh, they're going to have to uh, uh, really try to uh, focus more on how students with disabilities are performing and try to make sure that the uh, that they receive the specially designed instruction that they're entitled to receive under the law and the uh, results of that specially designed instruction uh, are, are, are noticed and documented uh, in outcomes and in, in measures of their performance. And I think that the court really uh, ha has taken a, a, a huge step in terms of saying to, to schools across the country, you got to do better. The kids deserve better than they have uh, historically been getting. Uh, and, and the pre previous standard, the Rowley uh, standard, which was uh, special, it has to be reasonably calculated to confer educational benefit, uh, was not enough. And they believed, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but the legal language was that kids with disabilities were receiving a de minimis education, meaning that they were getting minimal educational benefit, and they're entitled to receive more than that to maximize their God-given potential. And, and does the, I mean, the follow-up to that is, does that come with the funding from the feds? Is, is special education a federal business or is it a state and local operation financially? Well, that's a great question. You know, in 1975, uh, the promise that was made in public law 94-142, or one promise that was made, uh, was that schools would receive 40% of the excess costs they incur in providing specially designed instruction and related services to what we used to call handicapped kids that we now call kids with disabilities. And here, and President Ford, most people don't remember that President Ford was actually the president at the time uh, and signed Public Law 94-142. He had a veto message prepared, um, and he was going to veto the bill. And we talked him out of vetoing the bill. And in his veto message, he said that the American public school community would never see the realization of the promise uh, that they get 40% of the excess costs incurred in providing special ed. Uh, to students with this, uh, at that time, handicapped kids, now students with disabilities. And lo and behold, 43 years uh, into uh, uh, IDEA and since the passage of IDEA, the federal share is calculated about 16%. So we, we know uh, more about uh, funding from the federal level uh, than we do uh, about funding from the state and local level. And the majority of the money that's provided is actually state and local money. There has not been a study uh, of the fiscal uh, elements of special education in the last 16 years, and I think that's unfortunate. So we really don't know as much as I hope we would uh, about funding. Uh, what I will say is that even though a lot of people say that we need more money in special education, my hope and my belief is that if we reduced inappropriate referrals to special education, if kids that were struggling who were not disabled uh, received intervention in the general education setting from effective teachers using evidence-based practices deployed with uh, fidelity and treatment integrity, uh, they would not need to be referred inappropriately to special education. And if we dramatically reduced inappropriate referrals to special ed, by some estimates, 80% of the kids currently receiving special ed are kids with mild disabilities, if we dramatically reduced that a number of kids. Uh, school districts would have the same amount of money, but they could spend it on far fewer kids and, and really then uh, feel like they had the money that they uh, say that they currently lack to provide the intensity of services uh, that you guys at Linda Bell are famous for. You know, you all recognize uh, very early on that intensity of services is a key to having uh, uh, effective uh, interventions. And we don't do that in special ed. You know, the half hour a week or an hour a week that a lot of kids get uh, is insufficient. And uh, while people blame the funding, I don't think it's about funding. Uh, John Hattie and his work on uh, visible learning and the 800 meta-analyses he's done uh, to look at what works in education has also uh, determined by his extensive research that funding is not uh, something that drives effect size in terms of kids uh, uh, making growth, that it's actually uh, about uh, having effective teachers and, and using feedback and instructional strategies and pedagogy and other things that a lot of people blame money uh, or, or insufficient money uh, for. You talk about in the change in inclusion and the terminology change from handicapped kids to something that we're interested in, in the, which is literacy, of course. 
the inclusion of children with sometimes mild to severe reading disabilities has changed a lot over the years. And that's, I think I've heard you mention that has kind of flooded the, the roles of special education services. Well, it's, it's, it's great that you, you bring that up. You know, as we've talked about before, uh, the number one reason why kids get referred to special ed is reading problems. And the second reason uh, that, that causes uh, referrals to special ed is behavior problems. And the number one reason why kids have behavior problems is because they can't read. So it really is all about reading. And what we know from the meta-analytic data on reading is that a third of kids come to school already reading, and we don't screw that up no matter what we do in public schools. A third of kids are going to learn no matter what instructional approach is used in that classroom or in that school. And, and uh, um, what that leaves is about a third of our kids or more who are struggling. And you, know, you mentioned earlier that, that I was a teacher and I sucked when I taught. And part of the reason that I sucked was that I could not, I was not trained about how to teach that third or more of the kids in my first grade class who were struggling to learn how to read. And, and we see that continuing to this day, that uh, teachers in, in, in personnel preparation programs across the United States do not get the kind of training that they need to be able to reach kids who, who are struggling. And, and I, I know this from my uh, being on the board of the National Center for Teacher Quality, and we look at what's going on in teacher prep every year across the country, a sample of 750 colleges and universities. And you guys know this uh, at Linda Mood Bell because one of the things that you insist on is, is quality control and training your people to deploy your uh, evidence-based practices with tremendous fidelity and, and, and treatment integrity. And that does not happen in, in schools across the country. And what we've also learned, Dave, is that um, uh, special ed teachers get less training on how to teach reading than their general education counterparts. So what we thought in the past made sense, oh, the kid's struggling, let's send them for the comprehensive multidisciplinary evaluation, let's pin a label on the kid, let's go ahead and, and then say the kid's eligible for special ed, send that kid down the hall. So we take that kid away from a teacher who's had more training on how to teach reading, send that kid to a teacher who's had less training on how to teach reading, and then we wonder why the results are such shit uh, uh, over the years. And, and, and the, the, uh, the data that, that uh, we've seen uh, in terms of the stagnation in academic achievement, the lack of academic growth in the aggregate for kids with disabilities uh, um, is, 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 is troubling. And, and I know, and I, I, I need to say, that I know that great things happen for kids with disabilities every day in America's schools because dedicated people show up to do the important work uh, that, that, and the difficult work that we ask them to do. However, when you look at the aggregate data, it's very troubling and really uh, leads me uh, to conclude that special ed, unfortunately, is not so special for the vast majority of kids. And, and the, the fact that I just mentioned about them being sent to teachers who have less training on how to teach reading is, I think, in part responsible for the lack of academic growth for uh, way too many of our kids. I've talked to a lot of teachers in schools as I travel around, and special education teachers in particular feel overwhelmed by the onerous amount of paperwork and uh, things that they have to do outside of the classroom. How, how do we solve that? Well, uh, you ask uh, a great, another great question. So let me uh, uh, share with you. I'm, I'm a professional question asker, so that's... And, and anyone who may at some point listen to this. In the, the 2004 reauthorization of IDEA, one of the things that we did was we, we acknowledged what you just said, uh, and we did a study, by the way. We wanted to look at why special ed teachers leave more quickly than their general education counterparts. And the number one reason was what you just articulated so well, which is too much paperwork. You know, some people believe that a bigger IEP is a better IEP. And, and um, you know, special ed teachers got into special ed because they wanted to help kids with disabilities, not because they, they're practicing law. And IEPs have become way too much about CYA rather than about meeting the instructional needs of kids with disabilities. So um, in the IDEA reauthorization, we actually said, all right, let's, let's acknowledge that the federal regulations and the statute uh, may be responsible for a great deal of the paperwork. We weren't sure whether it, it's the feds causing it or whether it's the states causing it. 
And so we said a couple of things. One was, if a state decides that they're going to require more than what IDEA requires, they had to publish that, and they had to let people know what those requirements were that went above and beyond what IDEA requires and why they were uh, making those kinds of uh, additional, uh, some would say, onerous uh, requirements. And then secondly, and I think uh, this still blows my mind, um, we said in IDEA that up to 10 states could submit pilot projects to reduce paperwork. And, and uh, here we are 14 years since the reauthorization of IDEA. There's not been one state that has taken advantage of that opportunity to come forward and say to the U.S. Department of Education, hey, we'd like to try to reduce paperwork because we know that too much paperwork is driving special ed teachers uh, out, of the, uh, out of the classroom. And so to me, it's, it's a perfect example of, of uh, we suffer too much in education from problem admiration, and we wring our hands and we talk about the fact that there's too much paperwork, yet people are reluctant to go ahead and really take that uh, on uh, and, and try to do something uh, dramatic to reduce it, because uh, I would hope that we could reduce it. And, and the IEP, uh, the automated IEPs that have flooded the market and the number of vendors that are out there, they haven't reduced paperwork, they've just automated the paperwork. And, and um, you know, too many lawyers involved in special education, even though the number of, of uh, cases and, and, and due process complaints across the country uh, has actually reduced, uh, there's still a fear on the part uh, of too many uh, um, special ed leaders to actually uh, try and, and reduce paperwork. I had uh, quickly say that I ran this contest when I was working for the president and was on the road all the time across the country asking for the shortest IEP that was legally compliant. And no one ever took me up on that offer because I was, you know, to your point, I was anxious to see, can we figure out some way to reduce paperwork if we know, since we know, that teachers are saying that, that too much paperwork is driving them out of the profession. And sadly, uh, here we are, uh, 14 years uh, uh, since uh, IDA reauthorization, uh, I, I, I fear that some people still believe that a bigger IEP is a better IEP, and rather than reducing paperwork, uh, we're hearing stories about uh, increasing paperwork. Well, maybe at some point there will be some sort of market correction before it explodes and the system gets broken. One yeah, I would hope so. One can hope. So, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about some of your teaching and principal days. I know you're in a small school somewhere in New Mexico. And you happened I was, to- I was never a principal, but I was a teacher in Albuquerque, New Mexico uh, in 1971 and 72. Uh, Aztec Elementary School, I still remember it. Amazing the things that I can remember and things that I can't remember. Um, and and uh, yeah, first grade, and, and as I said, uh, you know, I. I I sucked, and I, I think I did two things remarkably well uh, when I taught. I called the roll beautifully uh, every morning, and uh, I think I did a pretty stellar job of taking the kids out to recess. Uh, but when it came time to uh, teach struggling kids uh, how to read, I, I sucked. And the reason I sucked was I was not prepared well. Um, and I think that uh, to this day, sadly, uh, teacher preparation uh, is not uh, what it should be. And we have too many teachers coming out of colleges of education, absent the skills that they need to do the difficult work that we're asking them uh, to do. And then I, I, I was uh, had tremendous opportunities in New Mexico where I spent uh, most of my uh, career before I had the opportunity to come to Washington and, and work for President Bush. Um, uh, being a superintendent, running uh, uh, the state institution for uh, juvenile delinquents uh, and, and really, uh, trying to learn more about resiliency and how to help kids who really come from very troubled uh, backgrounds and, and why do kids do the kinds of things that they do and how can we develop treatment programs to uh, really help them because uh, what most people don't realize is that uh, all of those kids are going to go back to the community at some point. We do not uh, have uh, life sentences uh, for juveniles, and certainly not in New Mexico. And so uh, they were not the ones that were in the, to remain in the juvenile system. There are many, as you know, that get bound over uh, into the adult system. And 
Florida at one point had more kids uh, in their adult system than they did in their juvenile system. But, you know, uh, is incarceration really the solution? And it costs $50,000 a year on average to lock a kid up compared to what we spend in public schools. And I think there are a lot of uh, concerns uh, that have been expressed about the school to prison pipeline and the fact that as a country, we lock up more people than any other country on the planet. And, you know, without getting into all of those uh, um, uh, issues. But I, I was blessed. I was able to start the, the state's first residential treatment center for kids who were very seriously emotionally disturbed. I had run a group home at one point. I uh, ran the uh, first uh, uh, children's comprehensive uh, uh, community mental health center, started a school for kids who, who were uh, with serious emotional problems with that the public school couldn't deal with. So I've really uh, been blessed and, and uh, have tremendous uh, opportunity. And I would say uh, looking back, you know, you asked me earlier about some of the things that uh, I'm most proud of. I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is that, that when I was uh, working for the governor uh, and, and leading the uh, New Mexico's Developmental Disabilities Planning Council, we closed down the institutions uh, that we had in the state for kids with uh, developmental disabilities. And that passion to uh, make sure that kids uh, don't live in institutions, that they live in the community, uh, comes from the fact that my brother, may he rest in peace, uh, um, started out his life in Willowbrook, an institution in Staten Island, and head down syndrome. Uh, if he had lived, uh, he would be now about 75. So 75 years ago when he was born, parents were told that uh, if you had a kid uh, with uh, down syndrome or some other uh, type of mental retardation, what we used to call mental retardation, what we now call cognitive and intellectual disability, institutionalized. And so he was institutionalized and uh, uh, never had a chance to really live in, in, at home uh, or in the community. He, he, later on, uh, we were able to get him into a group home in New Mexico, and you know, he, he did end his life um, in, in a community-based setting. But certainly when he started out, uh, it was not a good place uh, for people to live, and, and so I'm very proud that we were able to uh, to close down the institutions because um, uh, that's not where uh, people with disabilities should be living. You know, we talk about inclusion; they should be included so we can really uh, celebrate the diversity and the richness that they bring to uh, our entire community. We think we've made a lot of progress, and then you look back and you realize it was not that long ago that we were locking people up like that. Yes, and, and uh, one of the things that I, I had the privilege of learning from Senator Kennedy, may he rest in peace, was he taught me that the, a disability is not inability. And I think that, that that phrase sticks with me, and I think that um, we really need to understand that if people with disabilities can uh, do lots of things um, if they're taught and if they're given the opportunity uh, to learn. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, unfortunately, uh, as you say, you know, we... We, we've learned some of the lessons of the past, and I think it's important to look back and see how much progress we've made, but so much more remains to be done. And I think that uh, you know, if we learn more about the importance of early intervention and, and what we can really do when we uh, identify these problems early on and provide evidence-based interventions, we can change a kid's life trajectories from risk to resilience, and, and uh, my hope is, is that uh, that happens uh, as we go forward. You brought up Senator Kennedy, and I know from viewing your resume that you have testified testified in front of Congress many, many times. We see that on TV a lot now. What what moments uh, do you recall from that? It must be an incredible amount of pressure to have the microphones and lights in your face and, and tough questioning. What was that like? Yeah. Uh, um, it, it was a, a great opportunity. Um, it was scary. You know, the first times were, were very scary. Um, but... Uh, getting to know people like Senator Kennedy and Senator Harkin. Um, uh, Hillary Clinton was uh, in the Senate uh, at that time uh, as well. There were some champions for kids uh, with disabilities in the House. There were people like Mike Castle from Delaware who really, um, you know, th these are people who really cared about uh, what can we do policy-wise to uh, improve the quality of life for people with disabilities. So, yeah, there were um, there were scary moments, and it took a lot of preparation uh, for the written testimony that you had to submit. But the fun was really the opportunity to respond to the questions uh, that they asked and, and and interact with them and try to see if we could you know change a policy. And and one of the sad things was you know here we are. 43 years into, as we talked about already, uh, since the passage of Public Law 9442, 
still can't get the Congress to live up to the promise that they made uh, to, to provide 40% of the excess f uh, costs incurred in providing specially designed instruction. And so I guess the question you asked earlier, people who say that we don't have enough money, certainly that would not solve the funding problem, but I think it would help uh, um, give people confidence that when people in, that we elect make a promise that they actually keep uh, the promise that, that they've made. And, uh, you know, my dad taught me never to make an ass out of my mouth. And I think that uh, the, they're part of the reason why so many people in the country uh, don't have a high opinion of what's going on uh, in our city uh, and the people who we elect is that they don't keep their promises. So I hope that that uh, will change sometime in the future. Well, you've certainly spent a lot of time fighting the good fight. Do you come away from it feeling positive for the future or, or no? <laughs> well, you know, uh, boy, yeah, I, I am not uh, so optimistic uh, just because so many of the problems that we see today are problems that we have seen in the past. And, you know, how, why don't people have the courage to make some of the changes uh, that, that are needed in the system? Why do so many people continue to deploy practices that are not effective? Why do we spend so much money on professional development that doesn't work? Why don't we spend more on early intervention and early detection and understand that the best uh, return on investment we get for any money we spend on education is in pre-K? And Why don't we have universal pre-K? I mean, so there, there's so many things that we could do policy-wise that, that uh, we have not done. I just, um, you know, I, I'm optimistic that, that those things will happen, but I'm pessimistic uh, uh, about the reality of, of those things uh, really happening since my past experience over the last, it's almost 50 years that I've been uh, working with kids with disabilities. It's a long time, and I really hope the younger generation will have um, much more success, but I see a lot of people coming into the field now who don't understand our history, don't have that passion, um, and, and so I'm, uh, I'm worried about uh, where things go uh, moving forward. Well, I, you've probably met a few, and I have too. There are some folks out there willing to carry the mantle and continue the fight. So hopefully they get their uh, moment in the sun as well. Yes, and we need to encourage them for sure and uh, uh, give them the kinds of uh, support, uh, encouragement, and resources that they need to, to be successful and do the critically important work that remains to be done, because families are really depending on us uh, to, to, to help them. You talked about the college preparation for teachers, and a good portion of our audience are teachers. What, what can they do to pressure universities, colleges, these institutions to provide a more thorough development and preparedness for them? Well, I don't know whether the teachers are the right uh, audience to be putting the pressure on the colleges and universities. I think some of it comes from the failure of Congress to reauthorize the Higher Ed Act and to put accountability into higher ed uh, like we've had in, uh, with uh, public schools, uh, particularly since uh, passage of, of NCLB. I think the tenure system uh, where, you know, the professors get a job for life and, and, and they're not uh, um, uh, forced to stay current and stay up on, on current developments, you know, this, you guys know particularly at Linda Mudell, the, the research that's happening all the time. We've learned more about the brain in the last 10 years than we learned in the preceding 100 years. And so our knowledge is, is uh, exploding at an exponential rate. And a lot of these professors, unfortunately, don't revise their curricula, don't revise their uh, notes. Uh, they're, they're not uh, keeping up with the current developments. And I think part of that may be attributed to the fact that they have tenure and they're under no pressure uh, to, to change uh, their tactics. Uh, There's some uh, higher ed programs that talk about keeping students for longer periods of time. Well, when they haven't worked for four years what, uh, or, or haven't trained them in four years, what's to say uh, that they would do any better if they had them for five years? Why do we have student teaching at the end uh, of teacher preparation and then so uh, young people will, will spend a lot of their time in a teacher prep program and then they get into a classroom and they go, oh, this is not for me. I don't want to, this is not the kind of work that I want to do. Uh, why not put student teaching much earlier uh, so that uh, people could get a taste of uh, whether in fact uh, teaching is uh, their, their chosen uh, profession. And, and then, you know, taking a whole look at professional development, uh, sadly, 
there's too much evidence about uh, teachers going to professional development, uh, getting professional development, and then not implementing what they learn uh, in their professional development uh, classes uh, and sessions. And so I think that uh, there, there are just a lot of things that, that uh, need to change, and I hope that the, the next generation of uh, instructional leaders at the building level can really uh, do the kind of uh, work that needs to be done, that we have more coaching in schools because we know that uh, coaching really does help teachers uh, improve their ability to deliver evidence-based uh, and powerfully effective instruction. But those are the kinds of you know, things that, uh, that need to be done that unfortunately, you know, get back to my not being so optimistic about the future. I just uh, sadly don't see those kinds of things being done that we know uh, could be and should be done. Well, your career has, you have personally helped, I'm sure, tens of thousands of students directly and indirectly, and uh, kudos to you for fighting the good fight for so long, and I uh, look forward to keeping in touch with you in the future, and I want to thank you for being on the Linwood Bell Radio Podcast. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the Linwood Bell Radio Podcast. You can watch a webinar by Dr. Pasternak as a part of Linda Mood Bell's Leaders in Literacy series on our YouTube page. Follow Linda Mood Bell on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. We are Linda Mood Bell.